my talk will be on what combinations of drugs that can cause acute kidney injury. So I, I belong from Shiliguri, it's in the northern part of uh, West Bengal. And I'll be speaking on acute kidney injury, which is a syndrome characterized by the rapid loss of kidney function. And it is clinically diagnosed by the accumulation of nitrogenous metabolites and with decrease in urine output or both. And AKI supersedes the term which was previously used, acute renal failure, and is a spectrum extending from a less severe form to an advanced form which necessitates the need for renal replacement therapy. The incidence is quite high, and AKI in hospitalized patients is more than fourfold increased likelihood for death. So it's quite a huge problem, and acute kidney injury is something quite different from chronic kidney disease. And the hospital survival uh, are, uh, stat uh, the rates are also quite high in patients who are having more higher stages of acute kidney injury from no AKI to stage one to stage two or stage three. The AKI definitions are, multiple definitions are there. We know that IFL classification which involves risk, injury, failure, loss, and ESRD, and the AKIN classification where stage one, two, and three. So AKI is mainly defined as with an increase in serum creatinine of more than or equal to 0.3 milligram per deciliter within 48 hours of the onset, or the, if it is more than 1.5 times the baseline, and if the urine volume is less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for last six hours. So we have to pick, up it, pick it up early also, so we have to treat it early. Now regarding community acquired AKI and hospital acquired AKI, the number is huge. Sepsis leads, then CKD, background CKD is also another thing which you should keep in mind when we are thinking of the severity of AKI. There are certain modifiable risks like volume depletion or hypotension, exposure to concomitant nephrotoxins, high level exposure to nephrotoxins, and excessive medication dose for underlying GFR. And the non-modifiable risks are advanced age, comorbid conditions, high risk settings like ICU and burn units, shock states, stem cell transplantations, and genetic vulnerability. The patient factors are also quite important, but how common is my topic that is drug-induced AKI? In USA, it is around 14 to 26 percent of adults in prospective cohort studies and 37.5 percent in cross-sectional study. And in developing countries, more than 85% of the global burden of AKI is drug-induced. So it's a huge burden. The medications are a common cause of AKI, and that's the point of today's discussion, especially for patients who are admitted to hospital wards and ICUs. Now, the medications can cause injury by various mechanisms. Direct acute tubular injury develops from several medications which are toxic to various cellular functions. The respiratory pathways through the proximal tubules contribute further to AKI. Drug-induced acute interstitial nephritis also occurs when the medications elicit a T-cell-mediated immune response that promotes tubulointerstitial inflammation leading to AKI. Several medications cause acute tubular injury due to their innate toxicity and kidney handling, and another pathway of injury results from the insolubility of drugs in urine leading to their intratubular precipitation and crystals which are associated auto-inflammatory response. There is another term that is pseudo-acute kidney injury which is caused by drugs that blocks the tubular creatinine excretion as well as hemodynamic causes of increases in serum creatinine should be considered while evaluating our patients. Now etiology, there are pre-renal etiologies, there are renal etiologies and post-renal for AKI now, the drugs which are discussing is regarding the renal etiology, and the renal cause of AKI is very important. It can occur in various stages. Some, uh, there are various stages of development of AKI, and most importantly, the vasoconstriction in the afferent arterioles, NSAIDs, as you all know, is quite important as an injury, which causes injury to the kidney. The SGLT2 inhibitors by the tubuloglomerular feedback now, the AC inhibitors and ARBs, they act on the efferent arterioles. Proximal convoluted tubules, the, mole the molecules which act on are aminoglycosides, amphotericin B, tenophobia, cisplatin, and polymyxins. 
the thick ascending limb of uh, loop of Henle, it the diuretics and the aminoglycosides act there. So very importantly, we are certain areas of the nephron are affected by various mechanisms. And there are risk factors of nephrotoxicity are inbuilt and we have to be very careful. And this diagram is summarizes quite a bit. Now, can we halt the progress of drug-induced AKI? Yes, see, there is a window period from the initial renal injury to ultimately their detection and the ongoing injury over time. There is a window period from 8 to 48 hours. But what is important, we always measure urea creatinine, but the creatinine will start rising after 48 hours. So we can't wait for that. So we need better myomarkers so that we can pick them early. So instead of serum creatinine, cystatin C is available for AKI. And most importantly, in patients with AKI, serum creatinine does not increase until there is moderate to severe reduction in GFR. Thus, it's used for estimating GFR in early AKI delays the detection of the kidney damage. And serum cystatin C is a better marker in early stages as it is less affected by age, gender, muscle mass, and ethnicity. And multiple logistic regression analysis revealed cystatin C-based GFR reflecting decline in GFR with worsening AKI is better than creatinine-based GFR. And another important thing, MDRT is meaningless in acute kidney injury. We use serum creatinine to calculate the EGFR. It's for chronic kidney disease, not for acute kidney injury. And very importantly, a small change in creatinine is also very meaningful if you are dealing with kidney. Now, I am going into some clinical scenarios where multiple medications are causing acute kidney injury. The kid scenario one, a 60-year-old gentleman with congestive cardiac failure was on ramipril, developed proteinuria, and was started on an ARB, like a sartan. Serum creatinine levels started rising from the next day. So we all know the lesson is AC inhibitors and ARBs should never be used together. Scenario two, a 65-year-old diabetic gentleman who was on oral hypoglycemic regimen, which was uh, along which uh, depagliflozin and SGLT2 inhibitor was a part of it, and they, he presented with pedal swelling. He was found to have pedal edema, proteinuria, and the BP was quite high. So ramipril was started because it will help not only in the hypertension, but also in treating proteinuria. What happened? There was an acute rise of creatinine after five days. These are small things we should keep in mind, so I put this case scenario. See, the SGLT2 inhibitors are commonly included, and we all prescribe SGLT2 inhibitors and ARBs together. But certain cases like SGLT2 inhibitors specifically alter the renal hemodynamics, which contribute to increased sodium delivery to the macula densa, which is sensed as an increase in circulating volume at the level of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And thereby, there is a secondary autoregulatory vasoconstriction of afferent arterioles, a decrease in interglomerular pressure, and there is a reversible decrease in GFR. So after the initial fall in GFR, there is a trend towards increase over time. But we should keep in mind, initially, there will be a fall in GFR when you are adding the molecules together. SGLT2 inhibitor have a positive effect on the progression of CKD, particularly diabetic kidney disease. But there is a concern that they might cause AKI. So this one we should keep in mind in the acute setting. And there is no contraindication for simultaneous use of both molecules. But better to introduce the both of them sequentially, not together. Now the scenario three, a 60-year-old lady directed to have CA ovary, underwent contrast CT abdomen, thereafter started on cisplatin chemotherapy. Rise of serum creatinine levels occurred after two days. Here also, two molecules which are nephrotoxic are important. We have to use least possible isosmolar contrast. Hydration should be there. We should give a gap between the contrast study and the cisplatin chemotherapy to be started. We should check whether the patient is on metformin or diuretics. And we should always try to delay starting non-critical nephrotoxic medications by 48 hours after the contrast study. So this is also an important take-home message. So anti-cancer drugs cause AKI at there are by various mechanisms, and this diagram says it all. Scenario four, a 45-year-old lady with rheumatoid arthritis on methotrexate, she received zolendronic acid for severe osteoporosis, and she developed acute tubular necrosis. 
We know that gelandronic acid causes acute tectonic necrosis, but on the background of usage of methotrexate, the patient can be generally challenged by that time because there are multiple mechanisms by which methotrexate can have a background of kidney disease. So the lesson is methotrexate nephrotoxicity is dose dependent. Methotrexate oxidative and renal impairment may be a fatal situation and it can be removed by high flux dialysis. Scenario 5, a 55 year old HIV patient with hepatitis C co-infection on indinavir, lamivudin, abacavir regimen was started on amphotericin B for cryptococcal meningitis. She developed AKI with hypomagnesemia. And what is important is it was crystalline nephropathy and crystalline nephropathy is common with these molecules and this can cause acute kidney injury. Scenario 6, a 65 year old gentleman with left ventricular failure developed frequency and burning sensation during micturation. Urine culture yielded the growth of MDR Klebsiella pneumonia sensitive to amikacin. So we get many patients in our ICU where the patient with LVA presents with UTI. And it, as it was an MDR Klebsiella pneumonia sensitive to amikacin, which was started, the serum creatinine level started rising after three days. So what was the scenario there? The patient might, should always be on diuretics because the patient is having LVF and diuretic and aminoglycoside together, they ultimately, the excessive diuretics caused volume depletion and the uh, necro cell necrosis by the proximal convoluted tubule by the aminoglycoside led to this clinical deterioration in this patient. The scenario seven is a frail 60 year old nursing home resident admitted with cellulitis and for that the person was put on vancomycin after initial less response to coamoxiclab. Later, she developed pneumonia and started on piperacillin tazobactam. So after vancomycin, piperacillin tazobactam was added and AKI set in after two days. So piperacillin tazobactam potentiates the nephrotoxicity of vancomycin. So both are important because potential toxicity is the acute interstitial nephritis associated with the beta lactam agents like piperacillin tazobactam and the direct tubular toxicity associated with vancomycin came into the picture and caused the harm. Scenario eight. The 55 year old lady taking ibuprofen for chronic knee pain that she is on NSAIDs, she presented with flank plane, reduced urine output and raised creatinine after starting on pantoprazole. And we always commonly prescribe pantoprazole or any PPI along with any NSAID we prescribe. And the patient developed acute interstitial nephritis. The NSAIDs, as I said, it causes acute afferent arterial constriction, constriction I showed in the previous diagram. And for PPI, acute interstitial nephritis ranks amongst the rare adverse events. This immune-mediated reaction involves the interstitium and renal tubules, and it causes acute inflammation, tubular interstitial damage, which in the long term leads to interstitial fibrosis and chronic interstitial nephritis. And approximately 30% of patients who recovered from AKI remain at increased risk of progressing ultimately to CKD. So we should keep in mind that PPI long-term use and in certain patients we can do more harm than good. So all these combinations, as I said, are causing harm because we should keep in mind the mechanism of action and mechanism of it causing renal injury. So will COX-2 inhibitors be safe? Because they only have GI toxicity is less, but the renotoxicity and cardiotoxicity is there. So not even COX-2 inhibitors are safe among NSAIDs. So we should discontinue the drug if the patient is having a acute interstitial nephritis. Corticosteroids should be started. Even then, if it fails, may progress to CKD with interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. So clear recommendation, clinicians should attempt to identify other patient specific risk factors before starting empiric therapy. If a patient is at increased risk of AKI, we have to think of antibiotic options which have a decreased risk. If the patient does experience AKI, we should discontinue the offending agent immediately, decrease the doses of all other medications and adjust the dosages. A clinician should attempt to correct, stabilize all modifiable risk factors prior to initiating therapy with a nephrotoxic antibiotic. All clinicians should de-escalate antibiotic therapy once causative pathogens have been identified to potentially limit the duration of treatment. Drug combinations can cause AKI in both OPD and indoors, including ICU. Prior knowledge about unsafe combinations is the need of the hour, and that is our point of discussion today. And early recognition with drug discontinuation is critical to avoid CKD from irreversible kidney fibrosis damage. I have 30 seconds left because two minutes were shortened. That's just my last slides. The drug combinations are important 
and there are teams of scientists developing tools and calculators to better predict AKI. Good days are coming because these rank and colleagues are testing a recurrent neural network. These networks are coming up. Clinicians would then be able to provide optimal care early to minimize risk and long-term adverse effects of AKI. So prediction of AKI is important and the certain tools set there and over the next five years we hope that clinical utilization of cystatin will provide more data about cis generalizability and utility in drug dosing and AKI detection. Other biomarkers will likely start being evaluated in patients but will still likely lag behind cystatin in implementation. The research needs to focus on epidemiological studies and finally the importance of antimicrobial stewardship will only be emboldened by support from the certain authorities. Thank you for your patient hearing.